From Studio A at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, I'm Max Schwartz, and welcome to this installment of Trail Mix. Today in studio, I have candidate for United States Senate on the Republican side, Duff Sondheim. Thank you very much, Mr. Sondheim, for coming. It's a pleasure to have you in studio today. Max, real honor to be here at this incredible facility. Well, I'm glad you like it. Everyone sort of has that same jaw dropping reaction. Unbelievable. I mean, this is world class. Thank you, and we certainly like to think so. As I do with all candidates, if I do interview other Senate candidates, they will all receive the same questions. However, follow-ups may differ depending on individual answers. So without further ado, let's get started. Great. Who are you and why are you running for United States Senate? Well, I think I'm defined by my experiences, and one of the most important experiences was the family I grew up in. When I was back in Illinois, I grew up about 100 miles east of where Ronald Reagan grew up. Um, things went really well for me. I was a college quarterback. Uh, we had a lead in the senior class play, so on the outside, things looked really good. But at home, I had a brother with a mental disability. So every night that I came home, I came home to a mother and a brother that were down in the basement where my mom would say, you know, David, you have to do this. And my brother would say, but mom, I can't do it anymore. But my mom would say, David, you have to. And that was because she was afraid of losing her son, and I was afraid of losing my brother. So really what defined me back in those days was I really wanted my life to be about other people achieving the goals that they had for themselves and their families. And that experience really set me off on a path that uh, continues to this day. My aspiration is to help pe other people achieve their aspiration, and I think I can do that best representing the people of California in the United States Senate. Why represent them, why helping, or why Californians from Washington, why not Californians from California? Well, I think that really we have a fundamental breakdown in our system right now in Washington, and I am a uh, federal court approved mediator. I'm a state court volunteer settlement judge. I have the ability to bring people together that haven't been able to solve problems on their own. Uh, a lot of the cases I get have been languishing in the courts, sometimes for three and four years, and about 70, 80 percent of the time, in one day, I'm able to develop a solution. So I think that's what we need back in Washington, a common sense approach that is able to bring people from across the aisle together to solve our problems. And we'll get to working in Washington shortly, but in terms of qualifications, mm -hmm. why do you believe you are qualified to succeed Barbara Boxer? Well, I think I have a long record here in California of making things happen that haven't been able to happen before. So whether it's my involvement in the California Republican Party, when I went in there, 38 times in a row, the vice chairman had been elected chair. I felt the party was going in the wrong direction. The establishment really was being unresponsive to the needs of the people of this state. So I ran for chair. And even though 38 times in a row the vice chair had been elected chair, the 39th time was different, and I won that election. Then I got into the chairmanship, and I saw that the state was going in the wrong direction. We had taxes going through the roof. We had the deficits going through the roof. We had an energy crisis. And I felt we were headed on the wrong track. So I said we needed to recall Governor Davis. And people were saying, but Duff, 21 times before, people have tried to recall a sitting governor. And it's never worked. Why are you different? Well, I was focusing on the needs of the people, not on history, and we were able to get things done. Similarly, I brought redistricting reform to California, pension reform to San Jose, education reform to San Jose. So I've taken on the big issues, been able to bring together bipartisan coalitions, and come up with common sense solutions to very difficult problems. So how long were you chair of the party for? For four years, from 2003 to 2007. And what role specifically did you have in the recall of Governor Davis? So I was uh, the head of the Republican Party at that time. So I helped identify um, who was going to run for the office and then made sure that we had a message that resonated not only with Republicans, but with independents and with Democrats. And that's why uh, we won by such an overwhelming margin, is we were able to put together that bipartisan coalition. If it had just been Republicans, we wouldn't have gotten more than 30 percent of the vote. And in terms of redistricting, we now have the Independent Redistricting yes. Commission. What role, what did you do to reform redistricting before the commission? Sure. So I was on uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's uh, board of directors for his political affairs. And so we were one of the main 
uh, movers for that redistricting reform. And as you may recall, before we had redistricting, there was one district that went from Magic Mountain in Los Angeles all the way to the suburbs of Carson City, Nevada. So you had a situation where politicians were literally picking their voters. And I felt it needed to be the other way around, that the people needed to elect their politicians. And so even though redistricting reform had failed for decades, we were able to get it done in California. And that's one of the major problems we have in Washington today. We have gerrymandered districts throughout the country. And so as a member of the United States Senate, I will advocate for that type of redistricting reform throughout the United States. So were you involved in putting forth our redistricting, our independent redistricting commission? I wasn't exactly involved in the constitution of the uh, redistricting commission. I was involved in the initiative that provided for that commission to have the authority that it does. And in terms of redistricting, the Supreme Court has said that the redistricting commissions are legal. So is yes. that something you'd like to see all states to adopt? I think we need to, because right now the main elections for way too many districts is in the first round. And so if it's a Democratic-leaning district, the person that's the most liberal is going to win that seat. If it's in a Republican-leaning district, it's going to be the most conservative. And what I wanted to do is, if that is a liberal district, great. If it's a conservative district, great. But it should represent the views of that entire district, not just 10 or 15 percent of the district, which is what happens today. And moving on now, talking about the entire district, which would be, in this case, the state of California. Yes. Senator Boxer was, is, is a very important person in Washington, and she's very big, or she's a very vocal on the issue of environmental protection and climate change. What will you do, or what sort of role will you have in trying to fill her shoes? Right. Well, I think you're right. I think she was a very vocal person in Washington. Uh, we have a lot of vocal people in Washington, both on the Democrat and the Republican side. I hope the standard I'm measured against is effective how much am I able to get done? Not just advocating for certain things, but actually but getting the legislation done. how will you be able to get done. things done? What's your method of action to try sure. to get things done and fill her shoes? Well, I think, I've, again, I've shown that at all different levels. I worked with Mayor Reed, a Democrat, on pension reform, and we were able to put together an initiative that received the support of 70% of the voters in San Jose. So, and on the redistricting measure, again, that was a bipartisan effort. So I think I'm the only candidate in this race that has a strong record of bringing people from across the aisle to accomplish common sense uh, things that matter to the people of the state. So your method is bipartisanship? Well, I think it's common sense solutions. And common sense crosses ideological boundaries. Right now, Washington is locked down on both sides. The Democrats are locked together in one group. The Republicans are locked together in one group. And that's what I face in mediation all the time. And they're banging heads against each other. And the way you solve that problem is finding a common sense solution that moves things forward, not to the right, not to the left, but forward. And that's what leadership is all about. We've done that throughout our history. It's time for us to do that again. And on the environmental issue, do you believe in climate change? I think man is making a, a contribution to the problems that we're having in terms of our climate. But we're going down the wrong path. Because what we're saying is that we need to do less. I mean, if you look at Kamala Harris, she said the answer to the water crisis is more conservation. I don't believe that. I believe the answer is, doesn't lie in some bureaucrat's office 3,000 miles away. I believe it lies in the hearts and in the imagination of the people. Is there a role for government? Is there a role for regulators? Absolutely. But we've been a leader, not by the government bureaucrats that we appoint. We've been leaders because of the innovations and the, uh, uh, and the changes that we've made consistently throughout our history, whether it's the Wright brothers or whether it's computers and Steve Jobs. And what we're trying to do now is we're saying we can't solve this environmental problem through innovation. I just don't believe that's true. I think so we can solve this problem. plan for the environment and combating climate change? especially because it's such a big issue here in California. Right. Well, we need new laws. You know, right now what you have is the executive branch stepping in because Congress isn't acting. You have the Supreme Court on not an environmental laws necessarily, but in too many areas stepping in because the legislature isn't acting. You know, the first article of our Constitution is the legislative branch. It is the most important branch. But our environmental laws are 30, 40 years old. I mean, they were probably written on typewriters. So what we need is modern rules that understand where we are today and provide for the flexibility and the changes that are going to come in the next 10 years. And if, if, we don't, if we don't make that legislative change, 
we're going to allow the regulators to continue to have primary responsibility. And they're having responsibility without a legislative base underneath them. But a lot of people would say that your part, the party that you're running for is uh -huh. out of touch and won't act on climate change because they don't believe in it. How will you convince enough members of the Republican Party to actually reform climate laws or environmental laws if it's not something that they fundamentally believe in? Well, I think what you need to do on any change that you're bringing about, you're not going to bring along everybody. I mean, whether you're a Democrat and you, you know, have something where a majority of Republicans are somewhere, you're not going to be able to get every Democrat to go along with you. In terms of Republicans, you don't need everybody. And the great example of that is Republican Senator Vandenberg, who worked with the Truman administration on the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, and NATO, and really transformed our European foreign policy. But our polarization, as you know, yeah. is, and partisanship is yeah. much worse than it was back then. Um, some would say yes. I think there's some parallels. But notwithstanding, e if you do have these two blocks, equally weighted blocks, it really only takes eight or nine people of common goodwill to make that change. Yes, in that you would, uh, you'd only need a few Republicans if you got the entire Democratic caucus. But I don't, I mean, some would say that you could get, you're not even going to get any Republicans. Well, I just disagree with that, fundamentally disagree with that. Just, and I think it would be just as unfair to say you're not going to get the support of any Democrats. You know, I think right now we're in the process of where we vilify the Republican Party and the Republicans are vilifying the Democratic Party. I don't think that's constructive. Let's have an honest discussion about where we want this country to be in five or ten years, not the hurts of the past or the disagreements of today, but what do we want to leave for our children? And specifically, though, you haven't touched on any specifics. You just said new laws. What sort of mm -hmm. specific new laws would you look into for climate change? Well, sure. For, so, for example, I mean, we have regulations on smokestacks emissions and all. Those, those facilities don't exist anymore, right? So what we need to do is say, okay, this is the type of emissions that we currently have. These are the things that they're emitting. And so these are the types of, you know, whether it be CO2, methane, mercury, whatever. We need to have laws that take into account what things currently are. Those laws haven't been rewritten in 20, 30, 40 years. So it's that type of, I don't want to get too technical with your audience, but those are the types of things that you need to look at because that's where the changes are going to occur. And look, in California, we have the California Environmental Quality Act, 40 years old. It's totally out of step with what's going on. Look at our water regulations, totally out of step with what's going on. And you know who gets hurt by this the most? Not the people at the upper income level. It's the millions of Californians in the middle who are having to pay two and a half times the rest of the state in terms of housing cost, 50% more in terms of energy, and a dollar a gallon more in terms of gas. Those are choking the hardworking men and women of this state. Okay, and speaking of the state of California, we're going to move on and come yeah. and localize this now a little bit. Yeah. So uh, the country is currently facing a large sort of racial unrest in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement and the, all the Republican rhetoric about immigration. Where do you, what will you do to sort of diffuse the situation a, a, about, I guess, all the racial unrest and racial tensions we're currently having? And specifically on immigration reform, where do you stand on that? Sure. Well, there's a lot in that question. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, I've shown a strong history of working in underserved communities, as is my wife. Uh, she works with children whose mothers were on drugs when the babies were in utero, and she spends her days up in San Francisco dealing with people that are suffering through those types of problems. I spent a lot of time in East uh, San Jose, East Palo Alto, East San Jose is primarily a Latino area, East San Jose, East uh, Palo Alto is a little bit more mixed between blacks and Latinos. But what it starts with is listening and understanding what's going on in that community. So I worked on education reform there. For six months, I didn't say a word. I just listened to what was going on in the community. And then we brought the people of the community together with the business community and transformed the education system in one of the school districts where we doubled the number of kids on the honor roll. So what we showed is that all people of this state can learn. The real strength of this state is our diversity. And um, I think by listening and then working and addressing the unique needs of that particular community, we can solve the problems and bring people together. But in terms of immigration reform, what is your stance on that? What would your policy, or what, what sort of policy would you support? Sure, so I'm for comprehensive immigration reform, and with respect to the 11 million people that are in this country, uh, who have entered this country without legal documentation, I would be for providing them with legal status. 
So we can get into more details if you want, but we also do have to secure our border. Right now, it's a problem, but it could become a major problem. And so we, but I would do that not with 5th century BC technology, but I would use modern technology to make sure that we secure the border. And just a little bit on the pathway to citizenship, what would that entail? And in terms pathway of to legal status. Pathway to legal status, excuse right. me. So would that, does that include a pathway to citizenship? So those people that have entered the country I illegally would not be able to jump to the head of the line uh, because of their status. Because what I talk, when I talk with people that have relatives in the Philippines, Taiwan, other parts of the world where they've been waiting 10, 15, 20 years, I don't think that we should punish them further by having them wait longer because of other people that are in this country illegally. So I would say, look, if you have, don't have a felony conviction, and if you uh, otherwise uh, are, are you know, being a protective member of this society, you're more than welcome to stay. And you do have a shot at becoming a citizen, but you have to follow the laws just like everybody else. But you wouldn't, say, you wouldn't prevent them from being able to apply for citizenship down the line? That's correct. Okay. And in terms of protecting the border, what is, and using modern day technology, sure. what, just explain a little bit of that because sure. everyone knows Donald Trump's rhetoric about a wall. Yes. Well, again, that, he, he mentions the Great Wall of China. Frankly, that didn't work in keeping people out anyway. And that, again, that's a 5th century BC technology. Right now, we have drones and other methods of being able to track what's going on and it's incredible what people can do so if you take a certain number of steps in the direction of the border you can have a pretty good idea of what are the odds that that person is heading towards the border so that would be the types of tools that I would like to develop with the hard-working men and women of our border security team so that we can have much greater control over our border so some places the wall is the right thing to do some places the wall would be the most inefficient thing to do so let's focus on what the most cost-effective efficient uh, and effective methods are and bring those into being so that we can protect that border. And in terms of the African American community, mm -hmm. a lot of people would say that they're treated unfairly by law enforcement mm -hmm. and they're afraid to go out in mm -hmm. their own communities. Mm -hmm. What would you do to, to diffuse the situation and what will you do in terms of making sure that African Am people in African American and all minority communities aren't afraid to go out at night? Right. So again, I think the number one thing is involved is you take listening. You know, what is that personal experience? When I was in private law practice, one of my partners was black, and he would tell me the experiences he had even in a town like Palo Alto, where he would be routinely stopped because he drove a nice car and, you know, there was some suspicion as to how he earned that. And here he's an ESPN broadcaster. So I've not directly experienced it, but through somebody I worked very closely with, understand that even in today's society, that is an issue. So that is the reality that the people face. So I want to sit down, listen with them, t understand what's going on with, with them, but also we need to have the police officers because really they're playing an incredibly difficult role in our society. And I want to make sure that they get the support of not only people that look like me, but people that you know, uh, look different than me, so that the police are protecting all of us, because that's their role, and I think they take that job very seriously. There are some people that are, um, are, are bad apples, and we need to severely punish the bad apples, but I don't think we should just condemn the entire police force. I think we need to do a much better job of working together, and in some places of the country, that's working out extremely well. In other areas of the country, we have a lot more work to do. In terms of police retraining, because that seems to be a common call for action, yeah. Would you support and or author comprehensive legislation that would retrain the police officers of this country? I would support the effort to make sure that we're getting the best training possible. I haven't done enough examination as to whether or not a federal program is the best way to go or because, you know, the needs of the South Dakota community are very different than the needs of Alabama, which is very different would than the needs. Would you support increased spending to give states more money for police retraining? Well, I think we need to, whatever it takes to make sure that the police are properly trained, we need to do. Whether there are the funds there now or whether we need additional funds, I'm just not in a position to, I don't have enough knowledge of those specific budgets. But it is the primary look the primary responsibility of state and local government is the security of its people so we need to make sure that our police fire all the things that make us safe that they have the funds they need just like on the national level we need to make sure that our military has the funds they need to keep us safe and speaking putting this these topics together in terms of safety in the communities and in terms of the diverseness of the diversity in these communities do you support the sanctuary cities um, I think that if you have uh, committed a felony, 
um, or have been previously deported, you should be either deported or put in jail. I, th I do not support, as Kamala Harris does, you know, the situation where you have somebody that's been deported five times and committed seven felonies, and from her perspective, that person should be allowed to stay in the United States. I totally disagree with that. So I think that um, if you have committed a felony or if you've previously been deported, you, should be, you either should be deported or leave the country, or okay. deported or put in jail. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Candidate Sondheim. It was a pleasure having you in studio. And thank you, everybody, for watching this interview in its entirety. You can view, the, you can view Trail Mix on The Current, and you can stay in touch at Annenberg Media on Twitter, hashtag The Current.